I'm excited for today's topic, but let me just say a little bit about my Merriman journey so that you have a better understanding of where I'm coming from. Uh, around the time I was getting close to retirement, I realized I needed to become a better investor because I was going to have to live off all of the resources we'd invested. And I started listening to a lot of podcasts and following a lot of uh, online information. And I've discovered Paul, Paul Merriman and his foundation. And I was really interested in the work that he did. And I took a page out of my my mom's example and thought, well, maybe, maybe if I call him up and I volunteer, I could work for him or I could do some volunteer work and get a little closer to the source. And to my surprise, uh, he, I reached out with an email and he just called me back. He called up and we got talking and he had some ideas of things that I could do that he couldn't. And we started working together and I discovered he's an incredibly gracious teacher. He created this foundation entirely with his own money. Uh, everybody who works for it works nonprofit. There's no conflict of interest and it's just out of a genuine desire to help. And what I discovered as I started working with him is that it, he has access to a lot of historical return information. And I, he was very gracious in letting me access that information as a volunteer for the foundation. And using it, we were able to build what effectively is like a time machine. Um, so a little bit like a TARDIS. It lets us go back in time and look at how various investing strategies would have worked. Now, it's pretty common to do back testing with a fixed allocation. A lot of tools will let you do that. But to do back testing with a, a time varying allocation like a target date fund, or various strategies that might have you implement a glide path uh, was impossible. I couldn't find any tools to let us do that. And so uh, one of the contributions I've made in the foundation is to build a tool that will let us do that. And um, I'm going to use that in the work that we, we go through today to look at how various dynamic allocations would have played out in the past. Now, there's no guarantee the future will be like the past, but, um, you know, in the same way that I base tomorrow's experience based on yesterday's life experience. Um, it's the best predictor we have. So we tend to rely on it and we look for things that happened reliably the vast majority of the time, not outliers that happened rarely. And we let that guide some of the principles that drive investing strategies that we think are prudent moving forward. So um, since I'm talking to Bogleheads, I thought I'd bring up what I think are six of the best words Jack Bogle ever spoke. Um, buy right, hold tight, don't peek. I think that's a really, really nice summary of some of his most prudent investing advice. And today we're going to focus on the first two of those words, buy right. But the strategies we're going to talk about have the attributes necessary to be effective for the rest of the advice. Um, they allow you to buy right into something that is gonna be managed for you effectively so that you can just hold on to it and let it ride and look away, not be influenced by the ups and downs of the market and have a very high likelihood of doing well. <clears throat> the reason we're gonna focus on balanced portfolios and, and some of the reasons I'm excited about these simple balanced portfolios is they give us an opportunity to have a higher return per unit of risk. They also give us an opportunity to have higher safe withdrawal rates and higher survival rates, at least based on history, that's what we see. And they're also easier to manage. and. You know, this may not be as important for you as your partner. Sometimes it's important we think a step ahead to what's going to happen when we're gone. And uh, having a simple investing strategy that can be followed even after we're gone or that in a sense manages itself after we're gone might be really important to our partner or those who follow. So I think there's a lot of advantages to these approaches. And what we're going to cover today is, first of all, you know, what is a balanced portfolio? And then second, you know, what can we do with just a small number of funds and a fixed allocation? Uh, what can we do with a few funds and a target date fund? 
and how do they differ during accumulation and in retirement? And then finally, what do we give up by being simple? And we'll spend some time on Q&A as well. So first of all here, uh, let's, let's back up and look at what do we mean by balanced? Uh, and I think it helps sometimes to start out of categories. So if we just looked it up in the dictionary, we'd find that it's an even distribution of weight in enabling you know someone or something to remain upright uh, and steady. So think of riding a bicycle, that's balanced, right? Um, if we get a little bit closer to what we're talking about today, it could be an, a, a condition in which different elements are equal or in the correct proportions. And we'll look at an out of category example of that. Um, and then specifically for investing, usually what we mean is an investment strategy which balances risk and return by combining different asset classes, such as stocks and bonds. Uh, or as we'll see today, different kinds of stocks and stocks and bonds. <coughs> so again, thinking out of category for a moment, let's think about the world of flavors. Uh, if we were to think about all of the ingredients available to a master chef, uh, you'd have tens of thousands of things and you might be able to map them out and start to cluster them together and see patterns, you know, that like all of the cheeses are grouped together on this chart. But if we just had that understanding of the world as a chef, it would be kind of difficult to really do much in the way of cooking. Fortunately, scientists in the world of food have deduced that there are these underlying meaningful groups that uh, really define how we sense, how, how we sense these different flavors. There's salty, sour, uh, sweet, spicy, umami, and bitter. And you can group pretty much every flavor on the planet into these six categories. And what makes the difference between just an okay meal and a fantastic gourmet meal is how it mixes together these things so that they achieve some balance. And, and those, those of you who are Epicureans or love good food will, will know the truth in this. You know, when we go out for fast food, we tend to get salty and sweet. That's about it. Um, when we go out for a gourmet meal, it's typically, you know, got that mix of sour and spicy and salty and umami. And it's just, it's just a much, much better experience. Well, we can actually see almost the same thing in the world of investing. Uh, this is a picture of all of the S&P 500 companies. And so there's 500 of them. We could do the same thing. And, you know, you'd have thousands of companies. And you can imagine that they might group in different ways. They might group by industry. They might group by how they react to different uh, economic regimes. Some companies are going to be cyclical. Some are going to do better in periods of market expansion. Some are going to do better in, uh, oddly enough, in, in market downturns and uh, in recessions. So, so you could group them a lot of different ways. Well, the academics, not focusing on how they taste, but focusing on what drove their returns, have come up with a similar set of attributes. And so for, for the world of uh, fixed income or bonds, there are basically just two attributes. Uh, there's term and credit risk. Credit risk is pretty easy to understand. Uh, a bond is essentially a loan. If you make a loan to a fly-by-night company that's likely to go out of business, you're going to want a very high return for that. And so you're going to charge them a higher interest rate. Uh, if you make a loan to the U.S. government who can repay its, its debt with printed money that it can make any day it wants, um, you might accept a, a lower rate of return. You, you would, um, you'd have to pretty much. So that's credit risk. Um, term risk speaks to how long that loan is for. So a bond that is short term, like a month or three months or a year is likely to have a much lower return than one that is five years or 10 years or 20 years. And uh, bonds that have different characteristics here will deliver their returns at different points in time, which is also kind of interesting. In the world of equities, there are really five dominant factors that drive the returns. So for stocks, the biggest one is market, market risk. We expect to get a higher return by accepting the volatility 
that goes along with investing in the stock market. There's practically no stock or even an index fund you can buy that doesn't stand to lose 10, 20, 30% in a market downturn. So we expect to get a return for that. And historically, the market has delivered a return for that. Uh, if we invest in companies that are smaller, so that's the size factor mentioned here, they tend to be more volatile, riskier, have higher ups and downs, and we expect to get a higher return for it. And the academics have found that indeed there is a little bit higher return. It's not the strongest of these factors, but it's widely available and, uh, and there is some premium to be had for it. Uh, value speaks to the idea that companies that are out of favor, that are trading at a discount, um, these aren't the high flyers. They're, they're companies that are um, that people look down on in many respects. Maybe it's an industry that's out of favor. Because you can buy them cheaper um, a, and because they do tend to have this added risk that they're perceived to be out of favor, they have also had a higher return. And that's, that's actually one of the stronger factors here. Um, momentum. Companies that have been going up tend to keep going up. The problem is they tend to keep going up until they don't. <laughs> and when they don't, then you need to sell them if you want to still be a momentum investor. So uh, the momentum factor is strong, but it involves a lot of trading. You have to trade in and out a lot. And so there's a lot of cost in implementing it as a factor. And then quality. Companies with better financials, higher profitability have typically delivered uh, a better return over the long term. Um, so there you have the five factors. But as I hinted earlier, those are the five equity factors. Uh, these are available in different quantities in the market. And uh, so, so you can think of it as some of these are easier or harder to come by. And we can look at that by looking at um, there's a report available on Portfolio Visualizer called the Fund Factor Regression Screener. And you can go there and you can do this analysis yourself. But if you screen for funds that deliver 30% of any one of these factors, um, what you will find is that uh, when it comes to the market factor, there are literally thousands of funds that give you exposure to the market risk. You can get it in an S&P 500 fund, a total market fund a small cap blend fund, a large cap value fund, all of these give you exposure to that market risk um, as part of what they deliver. When you say you want something more than the market risk, say you want the market and the size risk, you find a smaller number of funds, but still a large number. There's about 1,500 plus funds available in the U.S. only that deliver this exposure both to size and market risk. Uh, value is a little bit harder to come by. There's about a thousand funds that deliver some exposure to value. <coughs> there are hundreds that deliver exposure to size and value. And in fact, there are hundreds that deliver exposure to size, value, and quality. So it's kind of interesting. These aren't called multi-factor funds, but they are because they're giving ex you exposure to the market, to size, to value, and quality. Um, when you and when you get though into looking for these other factors that i said are a little harder to come by like a fund that just gives you exposure to uh to quality or just to momentum or to momentum and quality um you get into this really tiny corner of the universe so i don't it, it's not that i think that those factors are bad but if we're going to recommend a strategy to somebody that they can implement in say a 401k can implement with international funds as well, we want to recommend a strategy that's going to have some cost effective, some low cost index or systematic funds available to them. And that typically is not going to be a momentum fund or a, or a quality focused fund. It's going to be a fund that maybe has small in value and quality um, or some of these other factors that we talked about. So if you, if you think about it from the standpoint of, uh, you know, go back to the kitchen analogy, what are the things available in somebody's pantry if they're in a 401k? Well, it's very likely they're going to have access to an equities fund like an S&P 500 or a total market. And that's going to give them some exposure to market risk. It's quite possible. It's, well, it's very likely they're going to have access to some fixed income funds, some bond funds. And that's going to give them exposure to term and credit risk. 
Um, the less common ones are going to be the exposure to value. Most 401ks will probably have a value fund. And a lot of 401ks will have access to a small cap value fund. And that fund may contain exposure to the market risk, the size risk, the value, and quality risk, depending on what fund is available. So the way I think of it is you have your staple ingredients over on the left, your equities and your fixed income, and then you got your spices over on the right, your, your mild and strong spices. If you just have value, it's kind of a mild spice. If you have small cap value, you've got a, a little bit stronger spice. Um, so <clears throat> before we leave this idea, I just want to give you some evidence that there really is a premium to be had and more risk to be taken for these different funds. And what I have here is uh, the back tests that you find uh, for the, this is the nominal annual rate of return or compound annual rate of return. Here, I'm going to switch this to uh, a highlighter. There we go. Uh, so this is the nominal compound rate of return um, for an S&P 500 fund looking back about 10.5, 10.6%. And this is the worst case drawdown that was experienced. Uh, which was about 51% for somebody who just bought and held an S&P 500 fund from the period 1972 through 2021. Um, this is out of my book, which is why it goes to 2021. Uh, this is also quite close to what you would have seen in the total market. Uh, it's slightly different, but the total market, because the total market tends to also bring in some of the large cap growth. Uh, but the total market doesn't, when you look at a market cap weighted index, it really isn't influenced very much by mid cap and small cap because the large and mega cap companies are so much bigger. So what I said in the previous slides is that there's a premium to have for value and size. So if we just go down and look at smaller companies going from the blend down to mid to small, what you see is that the return went up. Um, it didn't actually go up going from mid to small. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, but there was also a little bit more risk to be taken. So instead of a 51% drawdown, worst case uh, decline in the market cap, about the same 54% for small cap. Uh, we also said that there's premium to be had for value. And so when we go over here to uh, from blend to value, you go from 10.5% CAGR to 11.2. And again, there is a little bit more risk. About 55% uh, was the worst case drawdown. Um, mid cap uh, in the value category delivered almost 13%. And small cap value, this is what I described as the strong spice delivered a, a historical return of almost 14%, 13.94, with a drawdown of 56%. So, you know, on the one hand, you look at it and you go, well, it's higher risk, higher reward. The thing that I find really interesting, though, is that you only experience that worst case drawdown once along the way. You know, maybe you saw two times where you even got close to that. Um, but you actually got the compound rate of return uh, averaged over all of those years. So the compound rate of return is an effect that lasts the full duration. The pain is something that you just, you just pay temporarily along the way. Is it important though not to invest in something where the pain is gonna be so much that you capitulate? Absolutely, yeah. So um, the other thing some people may notice on this chart is that the dog of the whole batch is in the bottom right-hand corner. The high flyer, small cap growth stocks that people have too much confidence in, that have high visibility and probably no profit at all are the place where you have the worst potential drawdown. Um, and so this category, this bottom right hand category is kind of one to be avoided. So uh, let's shift perspective now and look at it with a longer horizon. Let's look at going back all the way to 1928. And let's look at nominal or not nominal, but real rates of return. So what did we get to keep after inflation? What was the real purchasing power benefit that we got? from investing in some of these different approaches. And we'll start with just the extremes. We've got stocks, bonds, 
and small cap value stocks. So the stock market at large uh, between 1928 and 2019 delivered a real compound rate of return of about 7%, 6.8%. And the worst case drawdown was a staggering 83%. Now this hap happened back around the Great Depression. Um, some people don't believe that we might experience something as bad again. I think it's important to take a broad historical perspective and at least consider the possibility that things, if they've gone that sideways once before, they might go that sideways again. Um, and interestingly, if you invested 100% in stocks, the 40-year, not 30-year, a lot of people use 30-year safe withdrawal rates, the 40-year safe withdrawal rate, so a little more conservative, was around 3%, which isn't, isn't too bad. Um, bonds, on the other hand, had a compound rate of return of only 1.9%. Not surprisingly, it was lower. Uh, the drawdown was only 9%, so much lower. And the safe withdrawal rate was 1.8%. Uh, Got to look around the camera here. Um, so uh, very conservative, you know, it, it did a very conservative thing, pretty much what you would expect. Small cap value uh, delivered a very strong 9% real rate of return, but it came with this 91% worst case drawdown. And that happened again back around the Great Depression. And it only delivered a, a safe withdrawal rate, a 40 year safe withdrawal rate of 2.3%. So, you know, if you were looking as a retiree and these were your only chances to invest, you would say all stocks was your best option from a safe withdrawal rate standpoint. Um, but nobody really does that. We all look, we, we know that balance involves at least mixing stocks and bonds. So let's look at what happens when we just look at the 50% combinations on the, on the sides of this triangle. And not surprisingly, when you look at those combinations, uh, the Kagers end up kind of in between. You end up with, you know, if you look at the uh, stock bond combination over here, we're 4.9% instead of uh, 1.9 or 6.8%, which were the extremes. Uh, if you look at uh, the combination of stocks and small cap value stocks, the Kager was 8.4%. Remember, these are real, uh, with still a very high maximum uh, drawdown of 87%. Um, and the safe withdrawal rate, though, is, is the surprise on this chart. So the safe withdrawal rate combining stocks and small cap value stocks was higher at 3.2% compared to 3% for stocks only or 2.3% for small cap value. When we combined stocks and bonds, we went from 1.8% safe withdrawal rate and 3% safe withdrawal rate for bonds and stocks, respectively, to 3.6%. And the biggest surprise of all, if we look at the combination of bonds and small cap value stocks down here on the bottom, we got a very respectable real Kager of 6.8%, a worst case drawdown of 60%, which is the second uh, lowest for the combinations, and the highest safe withdrawal rate. So how can, how can it be that the 40 year safe withdrawal rate for bonds and small cap value stocks going back to 1928 was over 4%? Well, the reason is quite simple. It's the most diversified portfolio. It gives you exposure to the term and credit risk from bonds, the market risk from stocks, and the size and value risks from the small cap and the value. It is the most diversified portfolio out of those 50-50 combos. So uh, interesting story there. If you were a retiree, would it be prudent to invest in a 50-50 combo of, of small cap value and bonds? I, I believe it would be, um, but you would have to have you know the right conviction and temperament to believe in it. It's a pretty extreme portfolio. So let's look at, um, well, before we go on, for those of you interested in the details in my book, I do all of the combinations and I do it for 1928 and I do it for 1970. So you can study these slides later or you can look at the book. Um, I just threw those in there for reference. 
Okay, so some of you have probably followed so far and you've got this idea that there's these ingredients, but um, you might not want to be master chefs. So what do you do if you don't want to be a portfolio chef? Is there a way to get the microwave dinner? Uh, and does the microwave dinner have to be uh, inferior? <laughs> so I'm going to hopefully convince you that the microwave dinner is A, available, and B, not that inferior. You can actually get a much better tasting financial meal with a simple portfolio than the microwave dinner would represent. And we're going to look at this two ways. The first way is to look at balanced funds. Some of you are probably familiar with things like the Vanguard Life Strategy Funds, um, but there are a lot, of, a lot of other balanced funds in the market as well. I'll just use Vanguard as examples because they're widely available and, and cost-effective, low-cost, and probably familiar to Bogleheads. The second way I think you can get something close to this, you know, microwave dinner, I don't want to be a master chef, is to use target date funds and combine them with a small cap value fund for diversification. And, and I'll use the Vanguard target retirement funds because I think they're widely available and cost effective, but you can use Fidelity, T. Rowe Price, or other funds to do the same kind of thing. So let's start by looking at some of these Vanguard Life Strategy Funds. Uh, they basically are a mix of global stocks and global bonds in a single fund. And they come in various levels of risk from low to moderate, to moderate, to moderate, to high, to high. And they go from 20% <clears throat> stock to 40%, to 60%, to 80% stock. And you can see those allocations down here. Now they haven't invested or, or they haven't existed going back to 1928, uh, but we can model these asset allocations and use the return sequences we have available to analyze how a similar allocation might have done going back in time. And that's what we'll do. And so using that kind of a historical analysis of these sorts of funds, we can go back in time and look at the allocation and, and what it would have done. And not surprisingly, what you see is that as you step across this chart from the least amount of risk to the highest amount of risk, with every step along the way, you've got a little bit higher return, about a 1% jump in return with each 20% increase in the amount allocated to stocks, but it came with a significant increase in risk. So the most conservative fund here delivered 6.5% uh, uh, Kager. This is real again, not, uh, not nominal. So this is after inflation uh, with an 18% drawdown. The 40% allocation delivered a 7.6% real compound annual rate of return with a 30%, 37% worst case drawdown. The 60% uh, stock allocation delivered an 8.5% real return with a 53% uh, drawdown. And the most aggressive allocation delivered a 9.3% real return with 65% worst case drawdown. So uh, the other thing we might want to look at is how diversified these are since we're trying to create a balanced portfolio. And what we see when we look inside these, and this is done by running a, a regression analysis on the asset allocation, is that interestingly, the most balanced of these is actually the least aggressive. It's got about a third of the risk in market, a third in term, and a third in credit. Well, why is that? Why is it as we add these stock allocations, they become less diversified in terms of risk? Well, the reason is quite simple. If you look at the amount of risk that the, the stock part brings to the party, it's very high compared to the amount of risk that the bond parts bring to the party. So as uh, when you have a 20% stock allocation, the volatility contribution from that 20% stock is roughly equal to the volatility contribution of the term risk or the credit risk. Um, as we move across the chart, what you see is that you end up with a portfolio that is more and more dominated just by market risk. And none of these provide meaningful exposure to the, the value or the size risk. 
Now that may be mysterious. It's like, wait a minute, I own the total market. Don't I get exposure to the all of the risk in the total market? Well, the only way you get exposure to the size risk or the value risk or any of those other risks is by being tilted, by having a disproportionate amount of your portfolio in small or in value. If you own the total market, what happens in growth basically counterbalances or offsets what happens in value. And what you have in large offsets or counterbalances what you have in small. So there's there's no exposure to those other potential diversifiers in these portfolios. Um, the last thing I look at in these is the 30 and 40 year safe withdrawal rates. And um, perhaps the most interesting part is that 30 year, which is what a lot of people normally think of, uh, was almost 4% uh, for a 4060 portfolio, a little over 4% for a 6040, and a little over 4% for an 8020. So if you go back to the Bengen research that says that a diversified portfolio with some amount in stocks and some amount in bonds, as long as it's meaningful, is likely to have about a 4% 30 year safe withdrawal rate, that seems to be borne out by this research. So everything we looked at so far really only gave us a little bit of balance. It gave us exposure to market, term, and credit. What would happen if we brought in some exposure to these widely, other, widely available other attributes of size and value? And to look at that, well, actually, before we look at that, um, uh, why might we want to do that? Why might we want to bring in exposure to these other values? If you go and you look at uh, Larry Swedro and Andrew Birkin's book, Your Complete Guide to Factor-Based Factor -based Investing, he has a really important story and message in there. And it's that these factors tend to show up at different times. So a multi-factor portfolio tends to disappoint, disappoint less often, or put another way, it tends to deliver Turns more consistently. <coughs> and you can see that in this chart over here. We'll, we'll focus on uh, this five year point. So if you bought and held a portfolio for five years that was only exposure to the market, like an S&P 500 or a total market fund, uh, you would be disappointed in the return. It would underperform approximately 18% of the time. Uh, the rest of the time, you'd get something much closer to what you were expecting in terms of, of returns. If, on the other hand, you had a portfolio that had exposure to market size, value, and momentum, and this is the example he uses in the book, it would have only underperformed about 5% of the time. So there's a, a, a consistency in the delivery of the returns that comes from having exposure to more of these factors. And we can see how that plays out with uh, another back test. So for this back test, uh, I have two examples that we had previously. We have one fund here, which is a life strategy 6040. Another example of one fund over here, which is a life strategy of 8020. So the numbers on the, those two columns are exactly the same as before. And then in the middle, I've got three funds and the three funds are a 35% allocation to US small cap value, a 25% allocation to international small cap value and a 40% allocation to total worldwide bonds. So this is a 60-40 portfolio, but it's similar to that uh, picture earlier when I combined just small cap value and bonds. And what we see is that the 60-40 had an 8.6% compound annual growth, growth rate, the 80-20 had a 9.3% compound annual growth rate, and the 60-40 had a 10.9% compound annual growth rate, the three fund 60-40. So you get a much higher rate of return than either of the other two, and you end up with a worst case drawdown that's actually between the two of minus 59%. So that's actually quite a bit higher return per unit of risk than either of the other two. And if you look down at the diversification, you can see that now you have a portfolio that is not just dominated by the market risk, but it's got market risk, size risk, value risk, 
and some meaningful exposure to the term and credit risk. But the most compelling story, I think, on the chart is when you look at the 30 and 40 year safe withdrawal rates. So the 30 year safe withdrawal rate going all the way back to 1928 for this three fund solution was 4.9%. And the 40 year safe withdrawal rate was 4.5%. Um, now the future may not be like the past. So you may want to derate the expected return or your safe withdrawal rate. But I think the uh, the evidence is compelling that having some meaningful diversification into these other attributes of size and value increased the resilience of this portfolio. <coughs> so everything we've talked about to this point has been a fixed allocation. Uh, Many people, though, when you think about investing, uh, will have a dynamic allocation. Uh, as you go through life, they will probably want to lower the amount of risk that they take in, in equities. And especially in the red zone, nearing retirement and after retirement, a lot of people are going to want to have less volatility, less uncertainty in the amount that they're going to have entering retirement in, the, in those early years of retirement. And uh, there's a reason, there's a, there's a real mathematical reason for why it makes sense to take less risk as we get older. And that's that our capacity to take risk, our, our human capital that we have left to recover from mistakes declines with age. And you can see that over here on the left-hand side. Uh, the exact shape of this curve is debatable, but um, I think everyone would agree that when we're 25 years old, if we lost our total net worth, we have a lot of years to work to get the money back. And we have a lot of uh, time to let compounding help us get money back. By the time we're in the middle of our career, we're going to have fewer years to work, fewer years for compounding to work for us. And if you look at somebody who is 65 to 70 years old, if they lost all of their money, it's going to be much, much harder for them to build a nest egg that they could retire on when they're no longer capable to work. So this general shape of this curve of human capital versus age has driven the invention of an incredible resource. And it's actually the default resource for a lot of young investors who are coming into the workplace investing in a 401k, and it's called a target date fund. And what the target date fund does is it effectively says, OK, if the average person has higher capacity to recover from a financial disaster early in life than they do later in life, we will invest you in a way that starts out with high risk, a lot of exposure to equities over here when you're young. And we will lower that with time such that when you get to retirement age, maybe you're in a 50-50 allocation to stocks and bonds. And we will lower that even more as you go into retirement to reflect that in those early years of retirement, it's kind of scary and uncertain and, and you'd like to have high confidence in the amount of money you have saved. So, um, this is the default investment for a lot of people. And the way it works is really simple. You just pick the year when you're going to retire and you pick the target date fund that has that number or the closest number to it in the title. So <clears throat> if you were a new investor starting today and you had 40 years to work and you're going to retire in uh, 2062, let's say, you would probably pick either the target retirement 2060 or 2065 retirement date fund. And it would automatically do all this in the background for you. It would invest in a global set of stocks, a global set of bonds. Um, it'd probably cost you about eight basis points, um, be very inexpensive if it's a Vanguard fund and your employer will do this all in the background. It's just a fantastic buy and hold investment for a young investor. And uh, I've analyzed this using our back tester to see, well, what would somebody get out of it if they just followed this strategy, if they just went with the default? And in fact, there's a new article that just came out in this month's AAII article uh, or AAII magazine that speaks to this analysis. And a young investor who would invest for 40 years, just 10% of their salary, and then use that in retirement, all invested in a target date fund, 
would actually have in real dollars more purchasing power in retirement and to pass on to heirs than all of the money they had earned in their working years. Now, again, this is historical, no guarantees, uh, but historically, this would have doubled your inflation adjusted purchasing power across a lifetime. So is that a prudent investing strategy for somebody who doesn't know how to invest? I think it's a fantastic and very prudent investing strategy. Um, I think we can do better, but for somebody who just has confidence in that, fantastic. I think it would be, it would be wonderful. I did wonder, though, when we first started doing this analysis, if uh, these funds do what they're supposed to do. Do they actually uh, deliver the risk profile you would expect? So I started out by going back and analyzing what happens for a lump sum investor who would invest in a target date fund. Uh, and this analysis just goes back to 1970, so a little bit less conservative than going back to 1928. But still, we've been through some tough times. For somebody who is a lump sum investor, it looks like this does exactly what it's supposed to do. Their worst drawdowns, their highest risk happened uh, within the first few years of investing. And that's because it takes a little time for the worst drawdowns to develop. And their worst drawdowns would have been about 45%. And around the age of 40, they would have started declining and they decline into and through retirement. But there's a problem with this analysis. And that's that the vast majority of us don't start by investing with a lump sum. I don't know about you, but I, you know, what we had as any kind of a start or a nest egg went immediately into trying to cover for housing and emergency funds and, and buying a house. And so we're really starting at zero. So what happens when somebody starts at zero and dollar cost to average is in? Well, now you get a totally different picture. Uh, it's actually uh, more than a decade before you get to the worst case drawdown and the worst case drawdown is a little bit lower. Why is that? Well, the reason is quite simple. During these early years, the worst drawdown or the decline in the balance of the account is mitigated by regular contributions and dollar cost averaging. And anybody who's worked as an advisor and had the good fortune to advise young people knows that this is the case a lot of the time when you talk to a young investor they they don't know how bad the market is because when they look in their account it's still up and if you're if you're still skeptical about this uh, you can go run and compare uh, drawdown charts like this one at portfolio visualizer this is an all small cap value portfolio going back to 1972 and what you see is that in these early years for a lump sum investor, there were these very deep drawdowns, but for somebody who was dollar cost averaging in, the drawdowns were much, much lower. And the reason is it's, it's just those contributions. Now, by the time you got out with this analysis to 12 years, the drawdowns are about the same. So it does go away, but in those early years, these regular contributions are really uh, a, uh, a buffer, if you will. They're, they're helping uh, simplify the task or the, the uh, amount of pain a young investor has to endure. And so with that in mind, we said, well, what would happen if you took a target date fund and you added some meaningful diversification by investing some of the retiree savings into small cap value? And we basically came up with three, th three strategies or approaches. The first is uh, to put just, if you're saving 10 cents out of every dollar in retirement, you put one of those pennies into small cap value and you put the other nine pennies into the target date fund. So it's a 90-10 portfolio and you don't rebalance in uh, accumulation. And in retirement, you do what I call nudge rebalances. You just take the full 4% withdrawal out of whichever of these funds is bigger than it's supposed to be. So if the target date fund is 92% instead of 90%, you take the 4% out of the target date fund. If the small cap value fund is 12% instead of 10%, you take the 4% out of that. And every year that very simple strategy kind of nudges things back towards where they're supposed to be. So a very simple strategy. Uh, the second one was uh, a moderate approach where we take one and a half times the time to retirement or years to retirement 
and we turn that into a percentage and we put that into the small cap value and the rest goes into the target date fund. This puts you 100% in the target date fund on entering retirement. And then the last one, we just went wild and crazy and said, let's be super aggressive and put two and a half times the number of years to retirement into the small cap value fund and then keep 20% uh, in uh, across the board as a, a constant allocation into small cap value. So um, in a sense, that was, that was the crazy strategy, but as we'll see, it actually isn't all that crazy. It has some benefits and it kind of argues in favor of keeping this meaningful diversification all the way into retirement. So this is how those equations kind of worked out. It's a 90, 10 on the left, one and a half times years to retirement in US small cap value in the middle and two and a half times years to retirement plus 20% in US small cap value on the right. So we can back test these allocations and see how they did. And uh, what we see is that um, not surprisingly, when you go from the target date fund to any of these other strategies, the compound annual rate of return increased. So when we add in this added risky asset, we go from an 8.5% compound rate of return for the target date fund to 9.4 for the easy strategy, 9.5 for the moderate strategy and 11.1 for the aggressive strategy. Now they did come with more risk and the, where the risk happens kind of shifts around. So you can see the drawdown curves here. The target date fund gives you the greatest amount of risk uh, at a 65% worst case drawdown. This is going back to 1928, around the age of 40. Um, the easy strategy was only 2% lower. So 67% worse, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, 2% worse or a 67% worst case drawdown. Um, but because it's a constant allocation, it raised the risk nearing retirement a little bit. So the moderate strategy has the highest risk in the early years uh, of the three we've looked at so far. It had a 73% worst case drawdown at around the age of 40, but it lowered the risk entering retirement. And then lastly, the most aggressive strategy had an 85% worst case drawdown around the age of 40, but it shifts some of the risk into the earlier years, as you can see. Um, and all of these had some meaningful diversification across market value and size and term and credit. Um, Another way to look at these is to think about, well, how did it multiply your purchasing power? What was the real multiplier? And so to do that comparison, what I do is I calculate a real dollar multiplier, which is the real balance at 40 years divided by the real contribution. So how much purchasing power do you get at the, uh, the time you enter retirement compared to what you put in? And you can see that down here on the bottom. And what you see is that for a target date fund, it was about double your money, 2.2 to 5.5. So this idea that you could double your purchasing power with a simple target date fund uh, appears to be real historically, but it also appears to be conservative. You could have done quite a bit better. If you look at the other strategies, none of them are worse in terms of the worst case. Um, they're all 2.3 on the bottom end but the median and the high end all went up. So for the easy one, you go from 5.5 to 7.3 as your multiplier, the moderate was 7.9 and the aggressive was as much as almost 14, 13.7. So these all appear to have the attribute you want, which is they're gonna help you take advantage of the years you have to compound to grow your nest egg. And then finally, um, I've added in here survival rates uh, well, actually, hold on a second. Now we're going to shift gears. We're going to, yeah, we're going to shift gears and we're going to look at two funds for life and retirement. So same strategies, uh, but now we're starting at age 60 and we're going to withdraw 4% per year, increasing with, uh, with inflation to the age of 100. So we're starting with a nest egg of say a million dollars, taking out $40,000 a year. Doesn't actually matter what the actual numbers are as long as the percentages match. And what we see is that in retirement, all of these strategies 
Um, the target date fund and the moderate are the same here because remember the moderate two fund for life strategy ramps you down to zero in the small cap value at retirement. So the target date fund or the moderate strategy delivered 7.2% as a real compound rate of return in retirement. The easy was 7.7. So that kept 10% in small cap value in retirement. The aggressive had 0.7% real compound rate, rate of return. And if we wanted to balance out the aggressive, that one that has 20% across the board in small cap value with some international, uh, so we split the, the funds between US and international small cap value, we lowered the historical return by a little bit, um, but we gained this diversification between the US and international markets, which is probably prudent. Um, if we look at the historical drawdowns, it gets a little scary because there were circumstances going through a 40 year retirement for all of these where we ran out of money. Now, in reality, would somebody just drive like a lemming off the cliff and not adjust? No, they probably would have adjusted and, and still made it to the end. But there were percentage, there were times uh, in taking that 4% fixed withdrawal with each of these strategies where we ran out of money. Um, now we'll look at the percentage of those times down below. So the 40 year survival rate for the target date fund or moderate alone was 88%. When we look at the easy strategy with 10% allocated to small cap value, it went to 97, almost 97%. When we look at the aggressive strategy with that fixed 20% allocation to small cap value, it went to 99.8%, which for all intents and purposes is, is close to 100%, right? And uh, if we diversified worldwide, it stayed above 99%. So all of these are showing you that in retirement, carrying some exposure to small in value gave you added resilience and you can also see the um the safe withdrawal rates down below and how they improved uh, as well by adding in some amount of exposure to small in value now in retirement rather than looking at the multiplier of your earnings uh, i've calculated the multiplier of your nest egg so if you think about the purchasing power of your nest egg when you retire, it was a million dollars in this example we just gave. Well, what do you get in the real withdrawals plus the real end balance divided by the initial nest egg? And you can see that here. The worst case is that you preserved your purchasing power with all of these strategies. It ranges from 1.1 to 1.2. Um, the best case for the target date fund itself was that you went up to 8.2. And remember, you know, life isn't the worst case. Life isn't the safe withdrawal rate, which is based on the worst case. The vast majority of us are going to experience something better than the worst case. So for most people in retirement, what this means is that they're going to see their nest egg preserve its purchasing power and probably even grow and become a valuable legacy. Um, and as we go across the chart, what you see again is that investing some in small in value didn't make the worst case worse, but it made the best case and the medium case better going across the chart. Um, in some cases, dramatically better. <coughs> so what do we give up by being simple? Uh, to model that, um, I'm going to bring in another concept here, which is uh, before we came up with two funds for life, we developed a very complex portfolio called the Merriman Aggressive Glide Path. And what it does is it uses 13 funds to implement a portfolio that's heavily tilted towards a global small cap value in the early years. And then it shifts towards a, uh, a more balanced, um, you can think of it as ultimate buy and hold or tilted, just slightly tilted portfolio to small in value in later years, more diversified. And it brings in uh, bonds as well. And you can see the, the allocation or the glide path over here on the right. So what I did is I compared its historical performance to this aggressive two fund for life strategy. And to just jump to the headline, the answer is that they're not that different. Uh, the lifetime internal rate of return was 11.1% for the two fund for life and 10.9% for the 13 funds. 
I'm not even sure if that's meaningful. Um, it's practically the same. The worst drawdown curves look almost the same. Uh, the biggest difference here is that there's a little bit of a, a shift down in the early years for the two fund for life strategy. It tends to pack some of that risk in earlier. And the other difference is that the two fund for life strategy follows this convention of the target date fund of carrying the risk reduction into retirement. But the bottom line is they're, they're very, very close to the same. So, so why would you pursue something more complicated? Well, there's a few reasons. The first is probably tax efficiency. When you go to a combination of two funds where you have this mix of bonds and equities in the same fund, you don't have the latitude to put the bonds in the tax deferred account and the equities in the taxable account. Um, and you also don't have as much control. You can't, for example, say, well, I don't like this 65, 35 allocation US worldwide that, uh, that Vanguard uses, I want to have a 50-50. You, you just don't have that control. Um, and then you also give up regret avoidance. When you own that 13 fund solution in the previous slide, it includes some REITs. So in a year where REITs do really, really well, you got some REITs. Or in a year where large cap value does really, really well, you got some large cap value. So does that matter? It kind of depends on how you look at your portfolio and how much you follow the market. And then finally, personal preference. Some people really like the complexity. It gives them confidence they're doing something more meaningful. So you know, it's, I'll, I'll leave that up to you. <clears throat> so in summary, uh, simple portfolios can be broadly diversified across companies, countries, factors, and age, uh, age. They can improve your likely return and drawdown risk and accumulation, and they can improve safe withdrawal rates, uh, survival rates, in short, really resiliency, um, and they can also give you more to pass on to heirs. Uh, they do give some things up. They give up customization knobs, the chance to always own what's hot, and the chance to be with the herd. Uh, if you want to learn more, um, I would point you to our website, www.paulmerriman.com. Uh, if you sign up for the free, the free newsletter, you will get a PDF, free PDF to We're Talking Millions, which I think is just a fantastic uh, early introduction to investing. And if you buy my book, Two Funds for Life, you'll get the, um, the detailed deep dive on Two Funds for Life and all of the profits go to the Merriman Financial Education Foundation.